Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to The Restoration Road. I'm so excited for you to hear today's guest story. Brian Bauer is an amazing man who has accomplished so much in so little time, and it makes me think of Luke 22, 26. You know, Jesus said, our culture, this is 2,000 years ago, it's very similar today, it's the exact same thing. He said, our culture tells you, if you wanna lead, lord it over others. But Jesus said, I tell you, there's a different way. If you want to lead, serve. Brian's story is one of the ultimate pictures I've ever seen of servant leadership and God lifting that up in order to multiply servant leadership throughout a community. Brian, thank you so much for being with thank us today. You. you have an amazing entrepreneurial story. And I just want to pick it up growing up. You're a servant leader. Everybody sees that in what you're doing now, and we'll talk more about that. But you caught that at a young age. Well, I grew up in Terre Haute, Indiana. I'm a lifelong Hoosier and um, not an overly exciting childhood. My father's a retired after 40 years as a police officer. And my mother uh, went back to nursing school. It was always a dream of hers to be a nurse from the time she was a little girl. Uh, went back to nursing school when I was in junior high and I remember seeing how hard she would work at night uh, after um, my dad worked all day and we had homework and things to do, she would be studying. And wow. um, so I was she was excited to become a nurse and I think that's part of what uh, helped to get me into healthcare is to see my mom as a, uh, a servant leader and someone who uh, served others. She truly is a nurse who would do it for free. Uh, God made her to be a nurse. Wow. And, uh, it was uh, neat to see growing up. Did you think about becoming a cop at all? I always wanted to be a policeman. My dad uh, was my hero, is my hero, and uh, he always will be. And I could sit here for hours and talk about stories uh, of my father growing up, things he probably doesn't even remember, uh, but seeing him take care of other people and always, uh, always serve other people. I think um, mm. we, we would never pass a car on the highway that was broken down. We would never, uh, he would always stop. He would always help. And he was the, he was the policeman who other people looked to in times of need. He wasn't just a, when he was working, he was a policeman. He was the, the guy at our church that people would call when they needed help, whether it was, uh, a good thing or a bad thing. He was always there. Wow. Uh, that had to be one of the critical moments actually it's a string of them, where you caught the servant leadership spirited from both your mom and your dad. Absolutely. Uh, my mom uh, has a special interest in bereavement and uh, helping families who have lost babies or uh, helping families at the hospital who have lost others. And she would always do that on her own time. Uh, she had a remembrance tree every year at the hospital for families who had lost uh, babies or lost children. And I always remember seeing my dad come in uh, with her, even though he didn't work at the hospital, he would always be there uh, to support my mom. But I think I was blessed with just lots of people in my life growing up who, you know, they didn't read a book on how to be a servant leader. Uh, it was just uh, who they were. I remember Bob Basler, he owns a grocery store in Terre Haute, and um, he's been able to compete in a market where there are bigger uh, chains with lower prices, and yep. he's always competed on taking care of his uh, employees and taking care of his his customers and doing what's right for them. That's proof no that people what. value that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, when did you pick up your first football? I actually uh, didn't play football until junior high. I think no the, the football coaches came over to our house and begged my parents to let me play. I was a, a, a basketball player uh, early on. I loved to play chess um, and I loved hunting and fishing with my grandpa. I loved being out, outdoors and I started football in junior high, played for the first time in eighth grade. What position did you play? I played tackle in junior high and guard and uh, center and defensive end in high school and center in college. At Butler University, I wanna talk about how you got there. Your high school coach was influential in your life, I think. you, Everybody in Terre Haute at least thinks about going to Indiana State and play for the Sycamores or go there for school, but your coach uh, had been investing in your life and he had another idea for you? Absolutely, I can remember exactly where I was. We were outside of the locker room and. All my friends were going to Indiana State. Both my parents went there, my wife went there. It's a great school and um, it's where a lot of people in Terre Haute stay to go to school. And 
I had been accepted to Butler and they wanted me to play football there. And he looked at me and said, Brian, you need to go to Butler. It's where you're meant to be. And um, when I chose Butler, it really put me on a path that opened a lot of doors and um, um, I think helped to put me on the path of where I'm at today. Um, did you major in business? I was a finance major. Finance major. And so what did you think that you were going to do with that? I actually went to Butler thinking I could be a teacher at first and a football coach. And um, I was intrigued by the school of business. Growing up, I, I had a lawn mowing business. I would, uh, uh, I would love for it to snow when it would snow. I would watch it and I had kind of a, a square mile neighborhood where I knew the houses I could shovel without asking them. Uh, early in the morning before the sun came up. And then uh, I knew the ones I could stop and ask. And then I had the ones where I would just start knocking. And about every third one, they would give me 15 or 20 bucks to shovel. And I would come back home about noon and my brother would still be asleep. And I would have three or $400. And That's uh, awesome. So I always had that, whether it was baseball cards or my lawn mowing business or uh, shoveling snow, I was always interested in trying to serve others. And and entrepreneurial about it. If Absolutely. there was a need, you could meet it. And Absolutely. What I love about it is you're working hard and you're working smart. I like how those things came together at a very early age. So where did you go after you graduated? You didn't... So I worked at Crow Chiswick. It's now Crow Horwath. It's a consulting firm out of Butler. And uh, while I was at Butler, I interned at a hospital. And that's um, what really caused me to fall in love uh, with working in healthcare. And uh, I had been at Crow a couple of years, and I actually saw the chief financial officer of that hospital at a Christmas party when I was back home. And uh, he said, I had a dream last week and uh, that you came back as my controller. And um, I said, you know, I'm not looking to make a move in my career right now. And um, he said, well, just send me your resume and let's talk about it. And I ended up doing that. And a few months later, I ended up as his controller, and that put me on the path to eventually become a chief financial officer, then a, a CEO of a hospital, and then um, to Lutheran in 2011. How long were you at the hospital before you're at 27 years old and you're the CEO? I hadn't been there very long. I was 27, 28 when uh, I was the chief financial officer and we had a CEO position open. And I wasn't interested in making a transition because I enjoyed being a CFO. And uh, the board of trustees encouraged me to apply and explore it. And uh, there were several candidates and about seven or 800 employees, and I became the CEO. And, um, um, you know, I think it really taught me being so young, the importance of being humble and continuing to serve others. My, my style as CEO in a hospital is to be visible and be accessible. I, um, I like to visit with patients. I leave my cell phone number for patients on their whiteboards and make sure that they can access me anytime. Oh my uh, goodness. They need because uh, we're ultimately there for the patients. Did you start doing that at a young age? I mean, as CEO at I did. I remember my father telling me, you know, a powerful thing would be to, you know, walk through the hospital every day and make sure uh, you're serving your employees and your patients. And um, I started it early on and I'm known for rounding in shorts and a t-shirt and no one really believed I was CEO, so I have to show my badge. But uh, <laughs> truly, some, some of the most remarkable stories of my career so far have been because I've been out uh, rounding. I've met some amazing people. We've, you know, a couple months ago, I met a gentleman who was near the end of his life, and um, he wanted pineapple juice, and we were out of it at Lutheran. And um, so I got in my car and drove to Kroger's and got pineapple juice and came back and sat with him and got to learn about him and his service uh, to our country. And he passed away a couple days later, but um, it's that human side of healthcare that um, really drives me every day. When I hear that, I see your mom taking care of patients and uh, counseling. And I see your dad stopping by the broken down car on the highway. That's just incredible. Absolutely. How that's been paid forward in your spirit. Absolutely. You met your wife uh, after college in Terre Haute. Was she working at the hospital? I was controller of the hospital, and she's an ER nurse and now stays at home with our kids. And uh, so I was surrounded by health care, and uh, we have three three sons now, six, four, and almost two years old. But and they're going to be athletes? I don't know. We'll see. They're, uh, as long as they're healthy and happy, and um, I'm good with that. Amen. Uh, so I bet you didn't wake up CEO uh, back in Terre Haute with 700 employees 
and see it as a daunting task. I bet you were energized by the opportunity to influence that many people. Am I right? Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> every minute of it. It's a, it's a humbling thing um, because um, every day I can walk upstairs and connect to mission. I can go play air hockey with a little kid who's fighting cancer. I can go talk to a surgeon who has just transplanted a heart and given a patient new life. And um, it's a, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, healthcare is a difficult industry and um, our employees come to work every day. It's a, it's not a job. It's a, it's a, it's really a way of life and it's hard to let it go when you leave. And just to be a part of what they do every day is um, what keeps me going. Well, you're so entrepreneurial and I think you're pretty young at the time. Uh, you have an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I don't think you have a lot of money at that point yet, and somebody lays on you uh, an idea, a business idea. Can you talk about that? I always love ideas, and I love investing in people and their ideas. Um, and then actually, one of my interns at the hospital, his roommate at IU and good friend, was starting a clothing company, a, a kind of a younger urban streetwear company, and they were making some neat designs, and uh, a couple celebrities wore it about a year later after seeing this, and. I had mentioned to him if he ever needs an investor to let me know, and uh, it was about a year later I got a phone call, and um, it was my now business partner who said, you know, we're we need some money to grow, and um, I heard if you wanted to, if uh, we needed an investor to call you, and I actually met him. Probably the most remarkable part about the story is I met him two days later in Bloomington, Indiana, and um, we made a deal on a handshake, and we didn't have any paper, or lawyers, or legal documents and uh, that partnership is still thriving today. We have nearly oh. 30 employees and a store in LA and uh, sales all around the world and it was built on on trust. Um, you don't always have to have a, an attorney in the room to get a deal done. That's remarkable because the original investment was relatively small compared to what the value is today. And when the zeros start coming on the end of that thing, it's very hard for both sides to stay with that handshake. It is. Uh, and I, I'm sure you've worked through all kinds of things, but it's just amazing that you're still uh, part of it. Whenever we feel the relationship maybe getting uh, a little strained, we always take ourselves back to uh, 224 North College in Bloomington, Indiana, and how neither of us had a whole lot at that point in time. And wow and uh, what our relationship has allowed this company to create. That's fantastic. So you're 27, 28 years old, CEO uh, in Terre Haute of the hospital. How do you end up in Fort Wayne? I got a call uh, that Lutheran was looking for a CEO of the hospital, and it was actually one of the most difficult decisions of my life because uh, I was in Terre Haute, Indiana, where I'd grown up CEO of a hospital in my hometown, and I was presented with an opportunity to go to a larger hospital, yet stay in Indiana. I never really wanted to walk away from this state. And uh, so I, my wife and I talked about it and prayed about it. And um, I said, well, let's explore it and see if it feels right. And I remember coming up here and we kind of secret shopped Lutheran. And uh, I walked through the lobby and asked people about Lutheran. We asked, we had dinner at the Oyster Bar, I think. And <laughs> we uh, asked people there what they thought about healthcare in Fort Wayne. And um, I ended up applying and uh, met with the board and Chuck Surak, who, you know, coming to Fort Wayne, I've met so many great people and mm -hmm. uh, Chuck's become a dear friend and Mike Eikenberry and um, people who have continued to serve as mentors for me here. But uh, we explored the opportunity and ultimately were uh, offered the position. And um, there were a lot of tears the day I announced in Terre Haute for I me, bet. especially, but uh, it's been a great move for our family. and. Uh, Lutheran truly is one of the best systems in the United States, and every day I drive by it, I'm just humbled that I get to be a part of it. How is leading Fort Wayne Lutheran Hospital different than being CEO in Terre Haute? It was a bigger facility. It was about five times the size mm. uh, Lutheran is, and uh, I'll never forget the, I stayed in a hotel for the first few weeks before my family came up here, and um, I was just astonished by the size of it, and I rounded on the weekend uh, in, a, in a polo and shorts, and uh, no one knew who I was at that point, and I remember the OB department wouldn't let me in because I didn't have my badge with me, and they didn't believe I was uh, CEO. But um, <laughs> I remember someone giving me advice. They said, you know, a big project is just a bunch of small projects rolled up into one, and 
that's been kind of my approach to Lutheran is, you know, while it's a bigger hospital, it's still uh, people taking care of each other and uh, just more departments and takes a little more time, but um, still um, just great nurses and doctors and uh, people taking care of their community. I know there's a CVICU nurse that's just outstanding. She is, she is. <laughs> My baby <laughs> Absolutely. girl. Absolutely. Um, how long were you CEO of the hospital until you became CEO of the entire network? I came here in 2011 and uh, in 2013, I became uh, network CEO over all eight facilities in Northeast Indiana. Did that involve a different board making uh, that we determination? We have a network board that's over the entire network, and um, that happened uh, in the summer of 2013. I would say the theme there is the Lutheran network knows a good deal when they see one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed with that. Um, could you talk about uh, your faith journey? Uh, you grew up in a Christian home, and uh, talk about when you uh, made faith real for your own life. Absolutely. I um, grew up going to church every Sunday. It was a priority uh, for our family. If it was snowing, no matter what, church was a priority. And um, a strong faith with my grandparents. My grandparents played a very important role in my life. I um, loved being outdoors with my grandfather. And um, I think there is a connection to God and being outside. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time growing up with my grandpa outside. Uh, but we were active in vacation Bible school and church camp and um, going to church every Sunday. And it, it really hits a point in your life where it sticks and you understand what it's all about. And um, For thank, you, that was when you were about 10? 10, 10? 11 years old, I uh, was baptized at Union Christian Church in Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, our minister there, Mark Grayless, is still a friend, someone I reach out to for advice. And uh, he actually helped to counsel me a little bit and making the decision to move to Fort Wayne. Wow. And you still have the Bible from that baptism? Absolutely, from my grandma. Oh, that's incredible. Well, I can't have a leader like you here not ask you some leadership questions. Is that okay? Absolutely. Tell me um, your view on marketing. Uh, there's competition in, in the healthcare world. Uh, tell me how you see the benefits of marketing. My marketing people uh, cringe every time I say this, but I believe uh, we could spend zero dollars in marketing and be the best system and grow because it's about taking care of every patient every time. There's nothing more powerful in healthcare than a great patient experience, and there's nothing more detrimental than a negative patient experience. And it doesn't have to be a, a negative clinical outcome to upset someone. Mm -hmm. uh, so often it's about cleanliness. It's about the quality of the food or uh, was someone kind to me? Uh, we can do the most advanced medical procedure in the world. We can transplant someone's heart, but if we're not kind to them uh, when they come into the facility or to their family or, or compassionate, uh, then that can be a negative experience. But we have to market. We like to uh, tell the community about the, the good work we do, but I'm a believer in that the, our best marketing tool is taking great care of our patients um, and word will get out. If you don't, there's not a whole lot to market, I guess. Absolutely, really. you've got to have a uh, you've got to have a great hospital um, because people, as much as I like to see billboards and commercials and different things, um, it helps with top of mind awareness. But um, I don't think people um, have a heart attack and say, "Well, I saw that billboard. I think I'll, no. I'll go to that hospital." They just call nine one one and That's right. they want to get taken care of. That's right. So I, I want to, what you said there dovetails a lot into management. What kind of uh, management style do you have or leadership style? Um, and how do you implement that with your team directly working with you and then the ripple effect throughout the whole network? I have a pretty informal management style. And um, again, I'm not, I don't think I'm a traditional boss. And I think that comes from being acutely aware of my age uh, when I was first made CEO. I, I always tell people that if I have to, force someone to do something, then I failed as a leader. Uh, they should do it because they know it's the right thing for the mission and for our patients and that we've built consensus for it. Uh, it should never be a, um, you have to do this because I'm the boss and I'm telling you to do it. Um, and it took, it takes a little while for people to understand what my priorities were. And, uh, but I think the organization, um, and the network has, has learned those and, um, Again, I learn from people at work every day. I, I get to work with some of the most talented people in the, in the world. Um, so it's a, it's a two-way street. They, 
they lead me and I help to lead them. I would think that surgeons and some of the doctors you work with are um, leaders themselves and have strong opinions on the way that they do things. How do you work with that? Do you ever have a conflict where you're thinking they should do something differently than the way they want to do it? Probably every day. <laughs> um, but I do a lot of listening. Um, and, you know, God God made healthcare workers to be assertive and um, and and to have opinions about things and to be critical thinkers and and you want that in your healthcare workers, uh, but sometimes when you put three or four thousand of them in the in the same organization, <laughs> uh, you can have conflict. And um, I do a lot of listening, and I'm not afraid to ask questions. I remember early on, um, I was in a room with um, some some surgeons and other physicians, and uh, someone kept referencing an acronym. I don't even remember what it was, and I was scared to ask what it meant. And then the person who I thought was the smartest person in the room asked what it meant. Oh. Uh, and I thought, you know, I've just got to ask the question because, yeah. um, you know, it's a, you got to ask questions in healthcare. If you're, if you're not a doctor or a nurse, you've got to listen. And um, so often problems will resolve themselves if you let good leaders um, uh, do their job. I remember I had an issue as chief financial officer with a physician, a real important physician, and I was working through it, and I called my boss several times, and he didn't answer the phone, and I was frustrated, and I ended up resolving the issue, and I went to his office, and I said, why didn't you take my call? You knew I was with this doctor, and he said, because I, he said, how's the issue? I said, it's resolved, and he said, that's my point. I knew you could resolve it. Wow. And I was going to let you do it on your own and not depend on me. That was a teachable moment. It was. And so that's probably the way you're rolling a little bit, right? Absolutely. Um, tell me the breadth of the network. Uh, where is it across the country? Uh, we have eight hospitals here in Northeast Indiana. Um, St. Joseph Hospital downtown, Fort Wayne. Uh, Bluffton uh, down in Wells County. Lutheran, our orthopedic hospital on Lutheran's campus. Our rehab hospital. Uh, DuPont Hospital on the north side of Fort Wayne that uh, delivers almost 250 babies a month, which is just tremendous. Uh, Kosciuszko Community Hospital in Warsaw, Indiana, and then a critical access facility, uh, Duke's Hospital in Peru, Indiana. Do you have a vision, mission, values? As a network, it's we talk about that a lot because getting that down to the bedside and to everybody in your organization, all 8,000 people, um, is just a daunting task. But we have a what we call a community cares culture. And everything we do falls under a community cares pillar, and it's uh, people, finance, quality, safety, growth, um, and and we try and align every meeting and everything we do uh, underneath those pillars. Safety is probably our our biggest focus over the past three or four years. Um, it's a thing that healthcare struggles with nationally, and um, we've really been trying to lead a culture of safety in our organizations. That's awesome. I've asked you about marketing. I've asked you about management. Now I want to ask you about money. Um, you have the finance background. What kind of a leader are you in terms of, of the, the financial part of it? Do you take risks? Or are you very conservative? How, how do you handle that? I'm a risk taker. I didn't, um, it was a struggle when I went from CFO to CEO uh, for my new CFO because I uh, needed to let him grow and, and, and do what he needed to do. And I needed to take the finance hat off. But I think it's been my biggest strength as a CEO is to come out of the CFO ranks and understand um, what makes the organization work financially. And um, it's a, uh, I like to invest in people and I like to invest in, in big projects and ideas. And we've opened a pediatric emergency department since I've been at Lutheran and we're renovating our children's hospital. We rolled out a second uh, air medical helicopter that uh, has served 350 more patients this year with wow. major cardiac and trauma flights. So. Um, I always like to grow and push the envelope and make sure we, we challenge ourselves to deliver great care. I think healthcare is probably uh, the biggest buzzword in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. it, it costs a lot of money for healthcare. Where do you see the future of healthcare? We have to bend the cost curve down as an industry. Um, this, I read an article the other day, the CEO of Kaiser in California mentioned 
that they had 21 million e-visits as a healthcare system and 21 million e-visits is a lot lower cost than getting in your car and driving to the doctor and waiting in an office and uh, everything that comes with a primary care doctor's office uh, or some other healthcare setting. Uh, we can take that cost out of the system and uh, we've got to work better with patients too to make sure that um, we're not just caring for them when they're in the hospital, but uh, we're trying to keep them out of the hospital uh, and keep them from being readmitted back to the hospital. A preventative uh, measure in Absolutely. Essence. We're one of the only industries where uh, we're now being tasked with keeping people from using us. It, it is counterintuitive if you were uh, running a restaurant or something else. Uh, one of our goals is to keep keep customers away. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I'm not trying to get you in trouble, but how do you see the future of government's role in healthcare versus private enterprise and competition? I think private enterprise and competition is always going to have a role in healthcare. Uh, Medicare is a large payer. Um, and obviously with the F Affordable Care Act and 30 or 40 million more people uh, having government insurance, um, they're going to continue to play a large role in healthcare. And, you know, what keeps me up at night, it's um, making sure that we have enough physicians and nurses and other providers to take care of the patients. I, um, with adding so many more people to the system without a plan in place to um, add more access points and add more providers to the system, uh, that could be a scary thing in 10 or 15 years as baby boomers age. And um, we need to make sure people always have access to healthcare. Brian, you're an amazing leader. I, I think you're a picture of a servant leader. You caught it from mom, dad, grandparents, and the people around you, coaches, and you're paying it forward uh, here in Fort Wayne. I really, really appreciate your servant leadership and how you've done so well at such a young age. Well, I've had a lot of good good people around me and a lot of mentors, and um, it's probably been the best part about Fort Wayne is uh, the minute I got here, I met people like Chuck Surak and Mike Eikenberry and Stan Buck and Scott Green and Kelly Bird and yourself. And um, it's just, I call it Indiana's best kept secret. Uh, Fort Wayne is just a, an amazing place to be and, and we love it here. It really is. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. So we invite you today to memorize Luke twenty-two twenty-six. 26. That the leadership God honors is serving. Anyone can lead because anyone can serve.